Welcome to the Waking Up Podcast. This is Sam Harris. Well, I am back from London, where I did an event with Richard Dawkins and Matt Delahunty. And I have a few more events with those guys coming up, one with Richard and Matt in Vancouver, and three next year with Matt and Lawrence Krauss. Most of you seem to love the event in London, and there was a great turnout. There were over 3,000 of you. But um, given a few comments I heard afterwards, I wanted to clarify a few things. I wanted to differentiate those events from my live podcast tour that's coming up with Live Nation, because I think some people were showing up expecting to see a live podcast produced by me, where I had complete control over the nature of the conversation. That's not what's happening at those events. But in anticipation of Vancouver and the three events I'm doing with Lawrence next year in New York, Chicago, and Phoenix, I will go out to all of you on social media and do my best to seed the conversations with the questions that most interest you. But you should know from my other events coming up in December and beyond, and those events are in Seattle, San Francisco, Boston, D.C., and Philadelphia in December and January. Those will be live podcasts, and there will be abundant Q&A with the audience there. Okay. Many of you on social media have pointed out to me that I have not commented on the shooting in Vegas, and you have questions about that. I will save that for my next AMA and not create a long housekeeping here. It seems, looking at my website here, that this is my 100th episode. I don't put any special significance on that number, but it's great to have made it this far. And I want to thank all of you who have helped me make it this far. Uh, the show continues to grow, and it couldn't grow without your help. Just did a great interview with Cass Sunstein, which will probably be the next podcast. But today I'm bringing you Nicholas Christakis. Nicholas is a sociologist and a physician. He directs the Human Nature Lab at Yale University where he is appointed as the Saul Goldman Family Professor of Social and Natural Science, and he's the co-director of the Yale Institute for Network Science. His lab focuses on the relationship between social networks and well-being, and his research engages two types of phenomena, the social, mathematical, and biological rules governing how social networks form, this is referred to as connection in his work, and the biological and social implications of how they operate to influence thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. And this is often referred to as contagion. His lab also does experiments in how to change population-level behavior related to health and cooperation and economic development. Uh, so it's very interesting work. And uh, I would have wanted to speak with Nicholas anyway about his work, but another thing that reminded me of the need to speak with him was his experience at Yale, which you may have seen on YouTube, uh, and you should watch it now if you haven't. But he was the professor a while back who was standing before a howling mob of students and stood there with the imperturbability of a saint, really, uh, as he was castigated by young men and women who were properly unhinged by their identity politics and some of the crazy ideas about speech that are rattling around in their heads. I'll embed a relevant clip on my blog. There are many, but I'll have one there where this podcast is embedded. And you will enjoy the first hour of this conversation much more if you've seen five minutes, at least, of that encounter, because you will see Nicholas's patience. You will see the, the untenability of the situation he was in you will see a, a hostility to dialogue among Yale students that uh, one could scarcely imagine possible. And this was, I believe, the first incident like this to come to national attention. This preceded the riots at Berkeley uh, preventing Milo's speech, and it preceded Brett Weinstein's ordeal at Evergreen, and it preceded the attack upon Charles Murray at Middlebury. So this was, if not the first moment like this, the first that became very prominent in recent memory. It makes for very interesting viewing. So Nicholas and I talk about all that, and then we get into the 
dynamics of mob behavior and moral panic and related issues. And um, I think you'll find it an interesting and useful and certainly timely conversation. So now without further delay, I give you Nicholas Christakis. I am here with Nicholas Christakis. Nicholas, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Sam. So we met at the TED conference, if I'm not mistaken. I don't, I don't think we've met since. I think that was in 2010. And if I recall, you gave the talk right after mine, or maybe it was just we were rehearsing together or something. But that, that's the, the, the moment I have in my memory where we shook hands and said hi was at TED just before or after one of us got off stage. Is that, does that jive with your yeah, memory? Yeah, we were, um, we were in the same session, and my memory is that you were sitting next to me as we were watching, um, watching the uh, speakers. And, you know, Sarah Silverman spoke, I don't know if you remember, and, uh, and, the, and the woman from 10,000 Maniacs, who, who I, who's singing I Adore, whose name I'm spacing on, and, um, and uh, you spoke. And what I remember of your talk was that remarkable slide, maybe that was the first time you used it, where you showed side by side photographs of a bunch of um, women uh, wearing um, the chador, and then a bunch of oh, yeah, um, the full burqa, yeah, the full burqa, and then a bunch of women, you know, on um, scantily clad, yeah, yeah, on a pornography or whatever. And you said they these are you know very different uh, moral landscapes, but we should surely and even they look like landscapes. I remember visually thinking, you know, there were these undulating heads in the way it was rendered your image and. Uh, and uh, it really got me to thinking. And, you know, the, the topic of moral relativism and moral universalism is an old one. But I don't think the sophistication of thought that we've been bringing to that topic lately has been very strong. Yeah. That was a, I, you made a big impression on me, too. So what, we're going to talk about your science and, and some of the science you presented there at TED and, and some of the stuff you've done in the intervening years. But first, just tell people, what, what is your background generally, academically and scientifically? Well, I am uh, trained in the natural and the social sciences. I'm a physician. Uh, I uh, trained as a hospice doctor, so I spent uh, 15 years uh, taking care of people who were dying. I was uh, my first appointment was at the University of Chicago, and I worked on the south side of Chicago, taking care of primarily indigent patients. Although I had a few uh, faculty and uh, you know sort of more well-to-do people, and uh, I worked uh, there as a hospice doctor. And then when I moved to Harvard from Chicago. In uh, 2001, I, I was a palliative, clinically, I was a palliative medicine doctor. So I, I was trained as a physician, but then also I was trained as a sociologist, and I have a PhD in sociology as well. And most of my career has been devoted to research. So I'm primarily a research scientist and doing work in public health. But, um, and I stopped seeing patients about 10 years ago now. Um, so I'm, I'm a natural and a social scientist. And increasingly, we do a lot of computational science as well in my lab. We'll talk about the science. Because obviously, what can be known about social networks and group psychology and many of the other topics you touch, you're, you're now touching AI or, or human yeah. interaction with AI. So all of that's very interesting. But I, I want to start with your immediate background here, because this is one reason why many people know of you and, and were eager for you to come on the podcast. You and your wife, Erica, were really the canaries in the coal mine for some recent moral panic is the appropriate name we've we've witnessed on college campuses. You are the man that many of us have seen standing in the quad at Yale, or I assume that was the quad, surrounded by a fairly large crowd of increasingly unhinged students. And this was really mesmerizing to watch. I can't imagine it felt the same to be in the middle of it. And, and I must say, you handled yourself as well as I could possibly imagine. And, and you have been much praised for the way you conducted yourself in that situation. And many professors have since found themselves in similar situations. There was Brett Weinstein at Evergreen recently. So I just want to talk a little bit about your experience at Yale and then move on generically to the problem on college campuses in general you know, as described by people like Jonathan Haidt and others who are, are focusing on the way in which there's a, a kind of authoritarianism emerging on the left, really exclusively, that is preventing free speech. And I want to get your sense of what's happening there and how big the problem is, and then we'll, we'll move on to the 
what we can understand scientifically about crowds and social trends, but insofar as you are comfortable talking about it, can you tell me about what happened at Yale? I think um, I have been devoted to, uh, you know, in, in some ways I, I'm a little naive in the sense that I believe in institutions. Um, I'm also skeptical of institutions and I am worried about institutions, but I also believe in, in social institutions. And so I've devoted my life to academia and to what I take to be their core commitments of modern American universities, which are envied the world over. And these commitments center around, if you look at the motto of Yale, it's Lux et Veritas. I mean, that's an extraordinary commitment, light and truth. And these institutions are committed to the uh, preservation, production, and dissemination of knowledge. And they are guided ostensibly by principles of open expression and reason and, uh, and debate um, and, and, uh, and sort of liberal commitments to the equality of human beings, um, their capacity to perfect the world. Um, the the knowability of the world or i in my view committed to a kind of a, a belief in the objective nature of reality and 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 i would strongly defend those principles and have devoted my life to them and in fact even in the narrow in issue of a free expression have been defending free expression often for disenfranchised populations for a very long time so i you know even before i came to yale 4 years ago i was at harvard i my wife and I had taken uh, some unpopular stands uh, defending the free expression of individuals who, um, you know, were on the side of Black Lives Matter, who um, were protesting. Um, there was a high school student who um, who had worn a T-shirt that says Jesus was not a homophobe, and uh, we came to his defense. There were some minority students at uh, Harvard who had uh, some concerns about the uh, the final clubs um, at that institution, the sort of... Um, sort of their kind of like elite fraternities. And um, and um, they had posted a satirical flyer, and um, and some people were unhappy about that flyer and uh, wanted to squelch the free expression of those students, and, and we came to their defense. And so we, you know, I am committed to this, I have sort of maybe naively bought in hook, line, and sinker to this belief that these institutions of higher learning in our society are are important that they are worthy of protection um, and respect. And, and so this is why when they fail us, I get very sad. Uh, I get sad for our society, I get sad for the students, and I get sad for the, the, the institutions. And I mean, I don't, I don't wanna just keep talking endlessly, but I mean, there's a, there's a parallel set, and I'll come back, I think, to your question. There's a, a parallel set of ideas about, about, about universities in our society. If you think about these universities, they are supported by tax dollars and the bequests of primarily wealthy people. And the reason this money is given to these institutions is to further the mission of the preservation, production, and dissemination of knowledge, not to provide faculty with easy lifestyles. I mean, it's a wonderful thing to be a professor. I, I, I see it as a calling. Um, but that's not the purpose, right? I mean, the, the point is that we are supposed to be that place which which uh, which uh, discovers things, which preserves uh, Sanskrit, which preserves Shakespeare, which preserves uh, antiquities, which preserves uh, mathematical knowledge and and uh, and scientific knowledge, which produces discoveries. We're supposed to be the place that transmits this to new young people, and and that's the role we're supposed to play in in society. And and we have a deep commitment to light and truth. So I get very upset when fields of inquiry or ideas are proscribed. And I think that we, if our ideas are strong, they should win the battle of ideas. If, if you're so confident in what you have to say, you should be able to defend it. Um, and your approach should not be to silence your opponents. Your approach should be to win the battle of ideas. I'm just going to interrupt you by, by reminding you of something you wrote, which appeared in the New York Times, which I think is the only thing you wrote in the aftermath of, of what happened at Yale, addressing it, you wrote here, quoting you, the faculty must cut at the root of a set of ideas that are wholly illiberal. Disagreement is not oppression. Argument is not assault. 
Words, even provocative or repugnant ones, are not violence. The answer to speech we do not like is more speech. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with that sentiment, and that's it's amazing to me that this even needs to be said and said as frequently as we now have to say it. How is it that the left, and again, I do want to come back to specifically what happened at Yale because many people just might not be aware of it or have forgotten the details, but how do you think it is that the left primarily has lost sight of this principle that the antidote to bad ideas is good ideas? And, and the criticism of bad ideas. Yeah, I think the right and the left take turns in this regard. I mean, let's not forget the history of McCarthyism on campus. And um, yeah, but we sort of we sort of expect the right to get this wrong at, at the extreme, right? I mean, the left is. <laughs> I was I was I was talking to some students here recently. Uh, they happen to be conservative students. Again, I should say politically, I'm left of center. I mean, I'm very progressive. I I have all I have some libertarian ideas. I have some conservative ideas, but mostly my if I've done these surveys, I am, you know, significantly left of center politically overall. Uh, anyway, I was talking to some of these conservative students, and I was about to say, you know, uh, you know, it's the left wing that marches in the streets, but that's actually not true. The right wing also marches in the streets at different points in history in different locations. I think lately it it has been um, it has been uh, the left which has uh, abandoned these principles, and and for me, I should say that there are things like free speech or a non corrupt judiciary or a strong defense, you know, which really should be apolitical. And I also think it's tactically idiotic of the left to surrender uh, this free speech. I mean, after all, let's not forget the Berkeley free, that's where the modern free speech movement was born at Berkeley. And to... Yeah, and that's that's where you cannot give a talk now without police protection. At, yeah, at every I mean, moment. I, you know, I don't agree with many of the things that Ben Shapiro espouses, uh, but the idea that $600,000 of police protection would be required for Ben Shapiro to speak on a university campus is preposterous. And it's a waste of money. I mean, I think this is the other thing that I think is is astonishing to me is that if we could preserve and cultivate and recommit as a society to principles of open discourse and and protest, I totally support protest. I support the right of students to protest. I believe that many of the most important movements, the civil rights movement, the gay marriage movement, many of these movements, which I wholly endorse, have been, the, the lead has been taken by young people and people protesting in the streets. This is the this is also part of the American tradition, and it, it reserves deserves respect and cherishing. But you cannot resort to violence or prevent others from speaking, and it's it's cost ineffective. Like, look at the money that six hundred thousand dollars could have been spent on dozens of students going to school for free, and 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 we yeah. you know when we yeah. lose sight of these core liberal commitments, I think we wind up spending money and um and eventually spilling blood, which is just heartbreaking. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's nuts that, that uh, or that um, many of these speakers need uh, protection. We're going to go back to Yale because I, I have to get there, but I, I'll just give a little more color to how crazy this has gotten. You, you sent me a, an article from The Economist prior to this interview, uh, which I hadn't seen, describing recent events at Reed College. And it reads like an Onion article. I mean, it's just an unbelievable document. I'm going to read a couple of paragraphs here to give people a sense of it, because as much as I've paid attention to this, I was still surprised by these Yeah, details. and I'll interrupt you before you said there's been a number of examples of almost stereotypical kind of cultural revolution, like almost Maoism, where the far left resorts to eating its own. So with Brett Weinstein, I mean, Brett is a completely progressive individual for his whole life. Uh, and, uh, and Rebecca Tuval, who wrote that piece, you know, I, she was stunned. And uh, this this professor at Reed, who, uh, you know, who I might or might not agree with about a variety of things, uh, you'll read, I'm a, uh, you're about to read the case. I mean, these, these, there's so many of these cases which are so hard to understand. And I hope we can talk a little bit about where they might be coming from as well. But go on. Definitely, definitely. Okay, so, so there's this Western Civ course that apparently has been receiving protests, it seems, in, in every single class at Reed. So that's the, the, the setup. And so now, quoting from the article, Assistant Professor Lucia Martinez Valdivia, who describes herself as mixed race and queer, asked protesters not to demonstrate during her lecture on Sappho last November. I mean, that's already an Onion article. I mean, it's, it's, and Sappho is a great hilarious. poet and also, you know, a, a favorite of queer theory as well. I mean, it's interesting. 
it's not a surprise yes, she'd be lecturing on Sappho, but still. Her poetry on love is unbelievable, but anyway, go on. I'm going to get some hate mail from my reaction to that, but it gets better. Miss Valdivia said she suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder and doubted her ability to deliver the lecture in the face of their opposition. At first, demonstrators announced they would change tactics and sit quietly in the audience, wearing black. After her speech, a number of them berated her, bringing her to tears. Demonstrators said that Miss Valdivia was guilty of a variety of offenses. She was a, quote, race traitor who upheld white supremacist principles for failing to oppose the humanity syllabus. She was, quote, anti-black because she appropriated black slang by wearing a t-shirt that said, poetry is lit. She was, quote, an ableist because she believes trigger warnings sometimes diminish sexual trauma. She was also a, quote, gaslighter for making disadvantaged students doubt their own feelings of oppression. And then this is a quote from, from her now. I am intimidated by these students. I'm scared to teach courses on race, gender, or sexuality, or even texts that bring these issues up in any way. I'm at a loss to, as how to address this, especially since many of these students don't believe in historicity or objective facts. They denounce the latter as being a tool of white, cis, hetero patriarchy. So I mean, this is just so insane on every level. And this use of the term gaslighting, with which I'm familiar, which has been used ever since the, the film came out, whatever, 60 years ago, but I hadn't heard this being appropriated by the intersectional mob. But then I, I recently watched, uh, rewatched part of the video of you talking to students at Yale, and I, and I heard one of the students uh, admonish you for gaslighting, which I hadn't caught the first time around. I have to say, Nicholas, that video is just astounding to watch, and I can only imagine what it was like to be there, not having yet been schooled in this trend that that this is the sort of thing that has been happening to people. Am I right about that? Is that right? Were you aware of this happening to anyone else before it happened to you, or were you, are you the, the first? I honestly don't know the answer. I don't remember if at the time I was, because since then there have been so many similar episodes that I don't remember if two years ago I um, was then aware of other episodes. Um, the, the, you know, the, part of the problem is here that there is some merit to some of the ideas, the, the grand philosophical ideas, and in my view, a lot of merit to some of the complaints of the students. And the problem becomes that these things have been so generalized and, you know, what Jonathan calls concept creep as well affects these phenomena. So what do I mean by this? You know, earlier you and I talked about a commitment to the idea that there's an objective nature to reality. Now, there is a long philosophical debate about this topic. It's a deep and interesting set of ideas about subjectivity, you know, can we even see the world objectively? Uh, does objective reality even exist? I think it does, but you can make an interesting philosophical argument. What about the notion of so-called social construction, the idea that what the, the gender of the scientist or the racist beliefs of the scientist color their objectivity? Of course they do. We have countless examples of this. We know this from research done by historians and others. We know that that it's difficult to be an impersonal observer, you know, that Every observer is situated somewhere. And I think there's validity to those ideas. Now, I also think there is an out there out there and that it is knowable and that we do our best to understand it. And so when you carry the, the rejection of objective reality to the extreme, that you call it a tool of cis, cis uh, hetero patriarchy, you, you really have kind of jumped the shark. Um, you've taken a core idea which says, look, we need to not always believe what we are told, or we need to understand how a person's position in society might affect what they see. Um, and we know this, this affects even ostensibly objective phenomena. We know that scientists, for example, looking, uh, so Emily Martin has done some fantastic work, which I teach, on how scientists looking at, you know, at, at uh, cell division or menstruation, you know, interpret the biology by virtue of who they are. But then it takes it to such a ridiculous extreme that it becomes absurd. And similarly, the notion of cultural appropriation. So the kernel of the idea there is, is that, that some communities are, of, of people are so denigrated that not only are they, let's say, killed and wiped out, but all of their ideas and, uh, and culture is, is stolen from them, is expropriated. They are effaced. And, uh, and that all that's left is a kind of caricature of who they are. 
And there is some truth to that too, that it's like, it's a, it's a, it's like adding insult to injury. You know, not only do I engage in genocide, but like I take all your, your, your ideas, your culture as well, and don't even credit you. And who am I to do that? The problem is that again, it's carried to a preposterous extreme so that now, you know, the, the, the whole history of ideas and of, and of culture of, of art and music is endless theft. I mean, it's endless uh, modification and, and uh, transformation and exchange of, uh, of ideas and of thoughts and, and, and uh, musical and artistic forms and so forth. So to, so to then start claiming that, you know, that uh, like in the Reed College example, that, uh, you know, that, that uh, she couldn't teach these things, uh, you know, she couldn't wear poetry is lit because she's appropriating um, African-American slang is just a, a crazy caricature of what is otherwise potentially an interesting philosophical idea to discuss. And so I think, you know, this is the thing that has made it especially hard for me is that I believe that I have a more than passing understanding of the epistemology here. And, um, and I have a more than passing sympathy for some of the concerns about that the students have about police brutality, about economic inequality, about racial justice. But I am deeply concerned with the, uh, the f uh, Maoist abandonment of, um, of reason and discourse and, um, and the kind of dehumanizing, atomizing of people. I mean, one of the things that has really depressed me in the courtyard that day, and I wrote a little bit about this in that one other prior, I think you're the only second public remarks I'm making about this, the piece in the New York Times. There was a young woman who um, I think was African-American, and she said to me very plaintively, and it, it pulled at my heartstrings, she said, um, you know, you cannot understand our predicament because you are a middle-aged and white and male. And, um, and I said to her, I said to her that I understood what she was saying, but that I nevertheless believed in our common humanity. And I believe that all of us, is, and I still believe this, that all of us as human beings can speak to and understand each other, united by our common humanity. And that even though I was a different gender and age and, and, uh, and uh, skin color than her, that I nevertheless could understand her and that I was interested in making the effort to understand her. And I would hope that she could understand me. And, um, and, and the, the, the students um, jeered at this. Yeah, yeah. And, that was, and then there was another student, a minority student, who later wrote a post in the Yale Daily News where he wrote that he had never been more disappointed in his colleagues than when I was then, uh, the titles at the time were that we were the masters of these colleges. Now they're we're called head of college. The title has changed. And, um, and he said, I'd never been more disappointed when the master made the argument about our common humanity and that his peers jeered. And so I think when, so my point is, when you, when you abandon the commitment to our common humanity, when you atomize people, when you believe that only certain types of people have authority to use certain types of cultural ideas or tropes, you efface for me, a fundamental reality of our common humanity and a fundamental tool we can have to interact with each other. So that professor at Reed, the claim that she can't wear a t-shirt that says poetry is, is lit is to me just pre is preposterous and violates every basic principle, in my view, that should animate a civilized society. To use the example of, of what the young woman said to you in the quad, that amounts to a naked declaration that meaningful communication is yes, impossible. Yes, which I, which I think is uh, really self-defeating in the end. So what is your yes. game plan if you're saying that you can't communicate your grievances... To anyone who is not exactly like you. Yeah, to anyone who doesn't suffer them along with or, you. But it's, yeah, but it's, I mean, so no, what, it's not what even help suffer are you asking because for? Because there are, there are other experiences that we all have had with pain and suffering and death and grief. Um, and you know, maybe I've not had exactly the same kind of suffering as you, Sam, but I'm pretty sure you've had some knocks in life. And I'm pretty sure that if we had a drink together and we're talking about a topic, that we would find common ground or shared understanding, even with dissimilar trajectories through life. Of course. One person struggled with poverty as a child. Another person struggled with the divorced parents. Another person, you know, escaped Vietnam on a boat. And another person uh, you know, witnessed violence and another person, you know, there, there are gradations and differences, but I believe people can empathize with each other. I hope. I mean, I, I don't. But so what was so disturbing about that encounter you had was the 
insistence that none of that is possible and none of that is ethically or politically relevant. And, and what was in its place was a desire to essentially shame you into silence. And, and this is, again, coming from Yale students objectively some of the most privileged people who have ever lived, whatever the color of their skin. I mean, this is just undeniable. Again, uh, you know, taking on board everything you just said about who knows what suffering even privileged people have had in their lives. But the idea that these were some of the most aggrieved people on earth, this was like the wailing of the widows of Srebrenica. <laughs> I mean, it was just, it was madness. And so again, this is, I'm speaking as someone who just watched this from outside, who's not, you know, doesn't know these students and hasn't lived with them and dealt with them subsequently. And so it's just, but just to see the breakdown of discourse through the lens of what you experienced there, again, from the outside was pretty startling. So I, I want to, I just want to, before we get more into this, and, and, and again, we're going to talk about the more general insights we can glean here about crowd dynamics and social contagion and, and all the rest. But before we do anything else, I, I want to back up and just remind people how this kicked off at Yale. What happened? You, you can be as abbreviated as you want, but just describe what the sequence of events. Well, I would rather have you describe the sequence of events. Sure. I mean, so, so in, in my recollection, what happened is your, your wife, Erica, who was also a professor at Yale, responded to an email that came out from the school admonishing people to dress in the most tasteful possible and politically correct uh, Halloween costumes. And uh, your wife, Erica, if memory serves, wrote a response to this to the, to the some hundred students who were under her charge in, what was it, their, their dormitory or their house? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, the, uh, the, the original email was sent by a, a, a dean, a person in the dean's office here, a man by the name of Burgewell Howard, who... Um, had previously been a dean at the at um, he, uh, at the Northwestern University, and he had sent the same Halloween costume email there, uh, and then sort of um, decided to resend it five or ten years later at a different university and at a different time. There, there had been, to my knowledge, no no uh, episodes of students wearing blackface at Yale or or pushing the boundaries in at that in that such such an extreme way. And uh, but nevertheless, this email was sent out, and and actually in the New York Times, the previous month there had been a whole exchange about this Halloween costume guidance. So in in the in the zeitgeist, people were talking about how this is getting a, was getting a little out of hand and seemed a bit silly that universities were providing official guidance on Halloween costumes. And I think there were six people who wrote in that article, and five were against Halloween costume guidance, and one was for it. And so there had been a number of emails that had come out at Yale at this time in the run-up. And I think this one that uh, Dean Howard sent was the, maybe the third and, and broadest, most detailed. It had links to acceptable and unacceptable costumes or recommended and non-recommended costumes. And, and, um, and it, was, it was coming from a, a positive intention. And that is to say that, you know, it, it, it's not necessary to set out to cause needless offense. Uh, you know, I, I'm not... I think in a free society, we have to tolerate offense, but it's not like I'm interested in deliberately offending people or, you know, and, and we can talk about some examples on college campuses where this can be hard. Anyway, and what had happened is we had been hearing from the students and Erica in particular had been hearing from her students that the students felt infantilized by this email. So many of the students were objecting to this, that they couldn't believe this. And Erica that day had taught a class, this was in late October where the students in the class was about child development. She taught a class about child development. And there was a, an animated and intellectually rigorous conversation about, about what, you know, what, what stage of development are college students at and are they capable of choosing their own costumes or negotiating among themselves, you know, if, they're, if they have taken offense, talking to each other and so forth. And because we had, um, it's more detail than you want probably, but because earlier in the year, so this was in October, in August, I had sent an email to the students, the 400 students in Silliman, the, the, that summer there had been the murders in Charleston where this, this man whose name I'm blocking, thank God, who went into the African Methodist Episcopal Church, the mother church in Charleston, and slaughtered nine or 10 people at close range who had welcomed him into their midst. So he was white and the victims were all black. And, um, you know, a vile and despicable carnage motivated by racial hatred. And, um, 
And there had been a lot of discourse in the public space that summer. And that was the summer where all the Confederate flags began to finally come down. And and I was um, very concerned about these events, like many people were. And I had organized a series of speakers at Silliman. We had a we had a famous African American historian from MIT who came and and spoke about the history of slavery in uh, American institutions. We we had uh, some people talking about um, other aspects of this. We also I had booked months earlier Greg Lukianoff, uh, who had come to speak about free speech. You know there was a series of public speakers. Anyway, I send an email in August, late August, beginning of September, to the students in the college about the aftermath of Charleston. And I talked about how, as a public health person, one of the things that I found most distressing was that that Walmart had stopped selling Confederate flags, but not guns. And that, in my view, this had it backwards, that there was all this focus on symbolism, but not on practical concerns, you know, that, that, that really we need to address, let's say, issues of inequality and issues of violence in our society, and that these symbolic things, while important, were distracting, potentially distracting us. So I had, a, I had an essay about this, which is, I think, still somewhere online. And it's a couple of pages. And the student feedback was tremendous. Dozens of students wrote to me and they said, wow, this has got me to think. And it was so interesting. And, and the masters at Yale, you know, previously we hadn't been spoken to in this way. And for me, this was normal. It was like writing an essay, like a thoughtful essay where you're trying to defend a point of view. And we had, we had done this previously at, at when I had been at Harvard. We, we, my wife and I had a similar role there. And I, you know, we would regularly communicate with our students in this fashion. And some would agree and some wouldn't agree. And you know, we had debates there about um, religious symbols in public places and uh, vegetarianism and, you know, could we roast a, a lamb uh, at Greek Easter in the college courtyard uh, using university money to purchase the lamb? I mean, you know, they raise interesting sort of questions for the students to debate. And um, anyway, so we got all this positive feedback for this, and there had been a lot of students complaining about the Halloween costume guidance email, and that was the history and the background. The New York Times article was in the public sphere. Yale students thought I was infantilizing. Previously, we had gotten some praise for engaging the students with ideas. And that's what motivated my lovely wife, who has spent her career taking care of battered women and, and inner city children and, and, uh, and, uh, and you know, homeless substance users. And this has been her life. Um, we we're very progressive people. Uh, got her to send this email, which said, you know, do you students? And the email, just to clarify, my wife's argument was not actually taking a stand one way or the other on whether the guidance was necessary and one way or the other on the costumes, she was saying, do you, stu you students should probably consider whether you wish to surrender this authority to superordinates. It, it fundamentally was a left-wing position saying you should be deeply skeptical of surrendering power to, you know, the state, to the administration, and you should talk about that. That was the, the intellectual essence of my wife's very gentle email, the aftermath of which you summarized earlier. Yeah, I mean, I should say that the email was utterly balanced, as was yes. Brett Weinstein's email to his administration, right? I mean, like, there's, there's no trace of racism. There's no trace of bigotry. There's no trace of failure of empathy. Or lack of sympathy for the students, right? It's, we, it's like showing respect. I believe we show respect for the students when we say, you know, we are interested in engaging you in ideas. And again, we're talking about people who are old enough to be shipped off to fight a war. We're talking about people who, in a few short years, will be on the job market as some of the most highly educated and in-demand young adults in the country. I mean, these are people who should be able to talk about a Halloween costume that offends them. Yes, but you see, the problem is, again, there's, see, this is, again, where I have some empathy and sympathy for the students, too. And so this is what was, is so challenging, because, again, you see, there's a kernel of, like we discussed earlier, with this notion of cultural appropriation and, and the, these claims that science is a, and objectivity, claims to objectivity are tools of oppression, you know, these, these ridiculously extreme claims, there's an element of truth as well to the student's sense of alienation. And part of it, again, is developmental. You know, 18 to 22-year-olds feel a sense of alienation. We all did, different ways. And now, you know, if you're a minority student in these institutions, there may be an extra burden of alienation that you feel. And I think there are ways that we can discuss that with students. I think there are ways we can reform our institutions. Um, and I'm not, I don't lack sympathy for that. But I, as Jonathan Haidt has said, you know, I think um, 
the fundamental commitment of these institutions is to lux et veritas. And, you know, this has to be done in a way in which we retain a deep and abiding commitment to speaking the truth and uh, having open expression. So then what happened? She sent the email and some furor erupted and then you stepped out of the building to talk to an assembled group of students. How did the the YouTube video we've well, seen? I, get... I'm not sure. I want to go into all the details because it's you know it's it's sort of almost like you know it's it's almost prurient. But um, you know I um, at around four o'clock on that day, I uh, the students had assembled in the courtyard and were um, were chalking uh, remarks. Um, some were very positive. Um, you know, we are one Yale. You know, which I totally endorse. And some were very specific and targeted at us and. Um, you know, I would, I would say, well, we're harassing. And, you know, I felt that it was appropriate to model my commitments, you know, that I had to walk the walk and not just talk the talk and that it would have been sort of um, cowardly to not talk to the students about their strongly held views. So I, I uh, went out into the courtyard around four o'clock to, um, to uh, witness what the students were writing um, and to just to talk with them. And, um, I um I sort of walked around quietly around the courtyard and made a show of reading what they had written to 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 dignify uh what they were communicating and to and to uh, uh model open expression. And so I just was reading all this prose that was and these slogans that were uh, written everywhere in colorful chalk and uh, unbeknownst to me the students had just left the courtyard where um uh they had previously surrounded the dean and um and some small fraction of them, I would say 100 to 150 students, something like that, maybe 150, came to the courtyard and um, and they assembled. And eventually, uh, you know, you, some of the videos that were, I mean, there were a, a dozen or two dozen people filming that that event. And at least six people released videos online, I think almost an hour. Uh, I, I think the only, if you can assemble from different clips that people released, the full hour between five and six o'clock. And unbeknownst to me, uh, Greg Lukianov, who had been invited um, uh, months earlier, he had been invited over the summer, and, and, and he had been invited by several entities at Yale. And uh, because I knew him, I asked him if he could add us, tack, us, tack on a talk on uh, free expression and First Amendment uh, to, as part of our speaker series um, that evening before he had his other commitments on campus. And uh, and he he arrived at five o'clock. I was already in the courtyard, and he was walking across the courtyard to his um to his accommodations in the college. And I didn't know he was there. I mean, I had no idea. I didn't see him. I was you know engaged with the students, and um and um unbeknownst to me, he also uh, took some video footage. And uh, then eventually things died down after sometime after six o'clock. And I think Greg was speaking around seven o'clock uh, in the college that evening. So. You know, I think it it was, you know, I think it was it was a challenging time in the certainly in my life. It was a challenging time, I think, in some of the students' lives. I was very upset. There was a lot of great hostility expressed towards one of the students in particular. And I came to her defense the next day. Um, we sent a tweet out saying that no one should be, you know, should be judged just for a, a short clip on video. Uh, I, she was wrongly doxxed, uh, by another organization, not by, uh, Greg, by someone else, not, of course not by Greg. Uh, and, uh, you know, also got many, many vile threats and, you know, I completely repudiate those threats. This was a young woman who I, I didn't know well, but, uh, you know, by, by report was otherwise a very sensible person. And I think she got swept away as, as happens when, uh, with mobs and, um, and, you know, I think, you know, was not at her best uh, that afternoon. And many people were not at their best. I mean, I, it's very important also to note that, um, that uh, I mean, as you have suggested, by having seen much more of the video footage, uh, a number of students were very strongly challenged by their emotions that day. I want to talk about mob behavior, but let's talk about your experience as this, as the the energy of antipathy was gathering around you here and and you were finding it increasingly difficult to have a conversation with a mob i mean let's just point and again people have to watch some of this video to see what you were dealing with and how well you were dealing with it but there's just a a problem of 
spoken word geometry. You, it, it's very difficult to talk to a large group of people, all of whom want to be heard, and any one of whom can interrupt you at any moment or, or demand that you not interrupt anyone else. And so it's just that the dynamics of you trying to reason with people who didn't want to be reasoned with were just obviously unworkable you for, know, I, for much of that. There are a few things that I did wrong, I think. Um, I was silent for the first hour from four to five, and I just listened to the students. And then there's no video footage that's been released of that hour because it's probably not very interesting. Although you're, you're impressively silent for stretches in the video that is yes, released. Yes, I was, I was interested in listening to the students and hearing what they had to say. and. Um, in the second hour, but they eventually the students, you know, wanted me to answer their queries. And um, some people have said, well, why didn't I sit down? And um, that's not a very wise suggestion in that type of a situation, in my view. No, and others no. said, well, why didn't you leave? The, clear, the students were clearly very heated, but that was not a possible thing for me to do in that situation. I was encircled by the students. And at one point, I, I suggested that I might need to go and fulfill some other duties and the, the students didn't want that. So so wait, wait a minute, I, I have to stop you there. So you actually felt that there was a period there where you couldn't have physically left? Well, I didn't test the boundaries by like barreling through the students. But, um, you know, I, uh, there was no obvious, I was surrounded. I mean, um, you know, there was, and there were students were five deep. I mean, there was, uh, you know, there was no obvious way for me to to go anywhere. Um, well, just the obvious question here, was there any moment where you actually worried that it would become physically violent? Well, I'd rather not go there. Um, I think, you know, I think that, um, I think that what I was trying to do in that situation was to try to get the students, I was trying to avoid a circumstance in which the students de-individuated. And there is a kind of inflection point during social movements of all kinds in sort of group dynamics where you can reach an inflection point where people suddenly feel anonymous and are disinhibited and uh, sort of social inhibitions fall away and people start acting in ways they would not otherwise act. And, um, and this is well understood. Yeah, I mean, you can see that even in what is said, apart from any possibility of violence, you can see that people's emotions are being amplified by the group dynamics, or at least that's that is the way it seems, because m much of what was being said to you in that circumstance, it's very hard to imagine any one of those students saying what they said, precisely how they said it, if they were just standing alone with you in, in yeah, your so office I think, or in the quad. I mean, I think that's, I think one of the things that's important to understand about mass movements, I mean, one of the reasons that they're effective is because they are demonstrations of social power. So, you know, when you have the, um, you know, the um, mothers against drunk driving, when people band together, individual mothers losing their children to drunk drivers aren't as effective as a political force until they band together. Or you have the march at Pettus Bridge, the Civil Rights March, or, uh, or you have, you know, um, the, the, uh, the um, I'm blocking on the name right now, the famous, the, the gay bar, it was at Stonewall, I think it was called. Is that right? Yeah, Stonewall. Yeah. You know, when you have events like that, which galvanizes interest and groups of people band together, it's, it's a demonstration of social power, and it calls for change in a way that an equal number of people atomized are not able uh, to do. But what you also get with those phenomena, in addition to the good that can come of it, uh, is, is, is the other phenomena, such as this uh, sort of point we're talking about now, where people kind of lose their identity is the sort of flip side of that as when they join the crowd. And, um, and so... And so what's very important in those circumstances is to get people, you know, so, so for example, in, 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 uh, in, you know, one of the reasons that people wear masks during uh, sort of orgies is to de-individuate. It's disinhibiting during, you know, during mass balls, you know, during medieval, you know, mass balls, for example, or, or torturers, you know, wear masks. Um, it's to, and to permit them to do these, to facilitate their doing these vile things. Um, I, I just want to say for the record, I always wear a mask at an orgy. <laughs> But, you know, this, there, there, there are these, there are these uh, well-understood social psychological phenomena which, you know, come to play at different moments. We're, we're you know, we're social animals. We're, we can understand human behavior through scientific inquiry. We, my lab spends a lot of time on this, obviously, in various ways. And, and um, anyway, on the point of de-individuation, you know, what's very important in those settings is it's very important for the um, people to feel themselves to be as individuals and not as part of the crowd and to feel themselves capable of moral agency. So you want the people 
to sort of be identified by name. You know, I am so-and-so. I'm not just part of this crowd. And you want them to see the person to whom they're speaking as a human being, right? Like there was a wonderful, like I have gotten death threats periodically in my life for not many, two or three or four times. And, uh, or I've gotten lots of hate mail. Well, not lots, but periodically I've gotten hate mail the last 10 or 20 years about different things. And I always respond to it, you know, unless I get, I can't cope with the volume of mail I'm getting. And, uh, and people are, and the person will send you these very vile things and you respond to them and they say, oh my God, I, I didn't think you would answer me. And then they'll say, you know, I'm actually not a bad person. I'm so sorry I said those mean things to you. <laughs> you know, you can mm -hmm. literally defang yeah. many people who send vile things because they, they don't recognize that you're a human being on the other end of the line and uh, that you're actually capable of talking to them. And, you know, not everybody can be dealt with this way, but some people can be dealt with this way. And so there was a wonderful experiment done by a grad student at NYU published about six months ago in which he was, um, he developed a system for identifying um, racist speech online, uh, people who were tweeting out a lot of very racist things. And he developed these uh, little bots. They, they were actually more like sock puppets. So he developed these accounts where the, the people, the, 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 these fake accounts, they were either a white person or a black person, the little photograph, the cart avatar of the Twitter account. And the person either had few followers or many followers. So it was low status or high status. And he experimentally, what he, he had a corpus of people who were sending out racist tweets. And when they did that, so this racist person, let's say, was sending out a very vile racist tweet with bad language to another person. So person, the racist person A sends a tweet out to person B. Then these bots, person C, would respond to person A and say very sweetly, hey, man, you probably shouldn't do that. There's a real person on the other end of that. And he found that this simple intervention, especially if you had a white person that did that with high followers, so his experiment was to test whether the status of the intervener mattered, he, but it, nevertheless, it was always helpful, as I remember the experiment. He was able to show that that simple cultivation in the person expressing hatred of a recognition of the common humanity attenuated the behavior for months afterwards that account reduced or eliminated the racist tweets they were sending. So my point in that example and in the other stuff we're saying is, is that you can actually use these basic liberal principles of our common humanity to redress and address wrongs and hatred and violence in our society. And, and you know, I think it's, I think, and to in some ways uh, attempt to tamp down a little bit on, um, on, um, certain aspects of mob uh, behavior. I don't know if I answered your question, but, but there are elements there of an understanding of social psychology that I think help us understand some of the phenomena that we've been seeing. Yeah. And do you think the, the dynamics of mob behavior in person, up close and personal, are in any way isomorphic with mob behavior online or do v very different dynamics yeah, come into play? Yeah, I think play? They're, they're very similar behaviors. You know, we have a lot of anonymity. There's no doubt in my mind that if you re removed anonymity from Twitter, the bad behavior would decline. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. That's uh, anonymity in almost every case now, I think, is corrosive of social fabric. It's not, I mean, it's not that you, you don't want to be able to be an anonymous whistleblower in, in some circumstance, but it's just it never brings out the best in, in people in, in normal interactions. Yes, but I am hesitate to oppose anonymity because I also think anonymous speech should be allowed. And, and you know, I, I struggle with the issue of anonymity. I, I think on balance online, it's a corrosive force, but I'm not prepared, you know, to, to say that nobody who is anonymous, you know, people, people write to me when I, I've, I've, I've taken the stand publicly that I think there's, that, you know, you should have the courage of your convictions. We should all of us work together to cultivate a society where we do not demonize people for their beliefs, that we engage them or we ignore them. Um, and that if we can create that kind of a culture, then I think we could also in parallel to that, like if we don't fire people for their opinions, for instance, like, like the ESPN reporter who, you know, called Donald Trump a white supremacist, I don't think she should lose her job. I think people should be allowed to have a, you know, I don't think we want a society where people are losing their jobs for expressing their beliefs. Well, well let's, let's, if we let's do stop that, there. Well, hold yeah. on. But if we do that, that also means then we can, if we had such a society, then I think we could also tolerate. We, 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 would, we would make it easier for people to have the courage of their convictions and publicly express their beliefs. So I, they all are locked together is the point. This, 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 this call-out culture and this culture of outrage 
is interconnects with these problems of anonymity and troll-like behavior. Right, but clearly there is a belief too far that can't be embraced by an employer. Certain beliefs are antithetical to the job requirement, right? If you have a, if, if you discover that somebody who's working for the NAACP is actually a, you know, the, the most committed racist in his private life, that's a problem for yes, his functioning no, in the job. There's, yeah, there's no doubt that there are such cases and examples as well. And, you know, for example, the police, you know, I'm not, there was a case recently of a firefighter who, who made some very racist remarks that, you know, would call his fitness for duty into question. I'm not, I'm not saying that we need a, that I'm certainly not saying that employers should be in all circumstances prohibited from, uh, you know, exercising their judgment or relieving employees whose beliefs or commitments are inconsistent with the performance of their duties. Right. Not at all am I right. suggesting that. But I am suggesting that there is an aspect to our culture right now. You know, it's like, it's like McCarthyism, you know. If you were a communist, he believed that you couldn't work in Hollywood, that you couldn't work in the State Department. I don't think there's anything incompatible between being a communist and working in the State Department or in Hollywood. I mean, that does, doesn't seem to me to be relevant in the slightest and, and, not, and not consistent with our American values, right? We're a plural democracy where we have heterogeneous beliefs and we're committed to free and open expression yeah. in my although, view. Although even there, so, I mean, again, I, my, my understanding of the history of of the Red Scare is not what it should be. So I, I sort of have to bracket that topic with my agnosticism here. But I can imagine, I mean, there, there, was, there was certainly a moment where it became obvious just how dysfunctional, I mean, to put it blandly, I mean, the, the real word probably is more like evil, communism was in its application on the ground in the Soviet Union. Yeah, but but you know, the the issue for me would be, and I'm not a communist yeah, yeah. at all, and I and I think more people have died at the hands of uh, the far left than the far right in the last hundred or two hundred years. But that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying obviously, if you're a Russian spy, you have no place in government. Period. Yeah, but, but there's no bright line between being ideological in a way that your the system around you can tolerate and being ideological to a degree that you are. Yes. Whether or not you are, in fact, employed by the KGB, you, are, you may as well be. Well, I don't know. You may as well be is different than you are employed. I think that is a, that is a bright no, line. No, because you're sufficiently committed that you will leak secrets if you can. Well, leaking is different than, than being committed. I mean, let's, there is a bright line between thought and speech and behavior. So being a spy is different than being sympathetic. And, and the symmetry is very important because they weren't going after the far right during McCarthyism. You know, if they're so concerned with the far left, they're, you know, if, if they were really concerned, well, what about the monarchists in the State Department? Maybe there was a monarchist in the State Department, and they should I'm have been— I'm certainly not defending Joe McCarthy, and I'm just—, I'm just yeah. <laughs> although, That's the world okay. we're in right now. Isn't it a some, crazy— Some people wouldn't put it past me. <laughs> I just think that there, the, the boundaries here are inconveniently fluid. Yes, and this is, this is the thing with campus speech again. Like, so what's amazing to me— is that a lot of the cases that are brought up these days about, um, you know, a speech that's out of bounds? First of all, there are well understood exceptions. Like one, like one of the distinctions that's often forgotten is the distinction between free expression and harassment. So, um, you know, harassment is, and and there's also even under the harassment, there's an exception for public figures, right? So, harassment is when you have a repeated, typically targeted speech against a particular individual. So, for example. So famously, the, the Nazis can uh, ma march through Skokie, Illinois, the Supreme Court ruled, but not stop in front of my house. The former is free expression, and the latter is uh, harassment. Right. And, um, and this is well understood, you know, I mean, there are boundary cases and difficult blah, blah, blah. On the other hand, so you can't threaten an individual. Now, it turns out you can actually say vile things about public figures, like the president or certain actors. I, I, you know, there's a whole other jurisprudence there as well. Because they don't have the same expectation of um, of not being quote harassed or criticized as other people, so there's all this. There are all these understood differences. There are boundary conditions about you know imminent inciting to imminent danger versus not imminent danger. So you can, for example, there are these uh, left wing professors that have been calling for white genocide. You know you can make abstract you know commitments to white genocide, but you know, it's different than saying let's get guns today and go kill so and so. Um, 
So there are all of these sort of um, cases. There's a lot of history of people thinking deeply about free expression and where the limits are. And one of the things that's amazed me is that, in, to my view, and to most the view of most people who have experienced with First Amendment issues, none of the cases we've been discussing are anywhere near those boundaries. I mean, you know, Shapiro is nowhere near a boundary. I mean, he's he's where we would think about, oh my God, this is a hard case. You know, do we or do we not? You know, and so and then I think what happens is is therefore we th this loss of subtlety of thought, and and calling Brett Weinstein a white supremacist, then what do you call the actual white supremacists? I mean, this is a ridiculous statement, and it it it's a kind of again, it's a kind of. Uh, you know, a kind of concept creep, a kind of extension, which, 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 which um, makes us lose the capacity to use uh, powerful words when they are actually needed. As we've just discovered in, in the excerpt I read from the Economist article, even someone who is mixed race and queer gets all of these epithets thrown yes. at her. I mean, so the, the words have no meaning. She's she's anti-black. Yes. She's yes. a race traitor. I mean, it's... Yes. Well, that ex that expression, too, breaks my heart. I mean, I'm, you know, that, that the, the expression race traitor was an expression that, you know, previously had currency in the 60s. And I really thought in the last half century and, you know, with the election of President Obama, who I, you know, greatly admire, um, that we had put some of that behind us, and this this fact that st students in 2017 would would resurrect, you know, such language is very depressing to me. So, who is to blame for this trend? Well, I guess the first question I ask is: Is this as big a problem as it seems, or are we is this just being magnified by a dozen or two dozen? Very salient cases like Yale and Evergreen and Reed and Berkeley and Middlebury and yeah, and there, uh, I mean know, there are many. There there are probably dozens now. But is this actually emblematic of a kind of creeping moral panic on our college campuses, or are ninety five percent of colleges oblivious to this trend? And if you could live a thousand separate lives simultaneously and enroll in all these schools, you wouldn't notice any of this on most campuses? You know, I, I honestly don't know the answer to that. There's, um, I see conflicting quantitative evidence about this point. So on the one hand, um, I certainly see many more anecdotes in my own life and many more cases. Um, this organization, the, you know, the FIRE, the Free, uh, uh, Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, and an extraordinary organization, in my view, is sort of a civil rights organization, um, has maintained a database and reports that increasing disinvitations, increasing episodes, uh, more campuses with the speech codes that really don't pass muster. Um, you know, they would report their quantitative data showing significant increases. And, uh, and, uh, and again, Jonathan Haidt has some other evidence that using uh, Google searches and other techniques to sort of quantify some of these phenomena. He he traces in a kind of inflection about four or five years ago to some of these events. But there's also other evidence that's against that. For instance, online, just the last couple of days, I've been tweeting with some people about uh, new evidence about, um, for instance, the National Opinion Research uh, Center at University of Chicago has for 40 years been collecting data on people's willingness to tolerate um, uh, you know, uh, prescribed opinions. And uh, they surveyed many prescribed opinions. Uh, you know, uh, atheism, you know, uh, can you be an atheist? Would it be okay for an atheist to speak in public, uh, teach my children? Uh, I forgot the third category. And uh, 40 years they've been asking that question. Uh, to be homosexual, 40 years they've been asking that question. Uh, to, um, I forgot all the categories. Um, and one of the categories was to be a racist. And, um, you know, we've made huge progress on most of the categories. But but my point is, the the according to that 40 years of data, there is uh, no, not much change in the public's tolerance, including young people's tolerance for proscribed speech. So their, their data would suggest that things are not worse now than before. And the Knight Foundation, and then there was this survey that was just released by UCLA, which showed that uh, very surprisingly large fractions of, there was a sample of 1,500 uh, students from around the country, uh, showed that very surprising, very large fractions of them had what I would consider to be illiberal views. You know, they would clamp down on speech in various ways. They equated speech with violence, et cetera. And yet, simultaneous to that was another report that was 
done by with the Gallup organization, I think that the Knight Foundation commissioned, which showed that, yes, that might be true, but the students were no different than the adults. So uh, about similar percentages in a parallel population of general adults. So my point is, I see, I don't know, exa- I, th- I believe very strongly that something is different on campuses, but I think the science, the social science is a bit mixed right now, the picture, and it's hard to know for sure. Insofar as it is a problem, who do you think is primarily to blame for it? I mean, the, the, the students, the administration, the professors, the, the, the parents well, of the students, there are many different roles here. Who, who do you put the onus well, on? Well, there are many people that, there are many, many theories about what's happening, but what I would say is that the, the actors that I think have a duty to address this are the faculty. And in that, you quoted from my New York Times piece from you know, a year or so ago, I think it's our obligation to preserve the commitment of these institutions to free and open expression. And I think it's our duty to push back against the, the false claim that speech is violence. And, um, and, and so I, I, I'm not going to blame the faculty, but I am going to say that I think the faculty have a duty to oppose these illiberal moves. And, and that I would hope that um, more and more professors would see this. I, I noted that I noted that a number of professional organizations. We had a couple of um, sociologists um, in the in the state of Connecticut. There was a a, a um, I think he was African American professor of sociology who who made some um, rather racist remarks, and um, and uh, there was you know calls to fire him. I don't think he should have been fired. Myself, I don't, and um, and um, I don't agree with his remarks, but I don't think he should have been fired. And um, and then the some professional organizations came to his defense, but you know a lot of people pointed out that this was very hypocritical. I mean, where were these professional organizations defending right wing expression? You know, we can't they they lose credibility if they don't exp- if they only come out and protect left wing expression. And I think this is the crucial thing. You know, all these people on the right that are against disinvitations. Well, you should then also be opposed to the disinvitation of Chelsea Manning. And all these people on the right that are protecting free speech, well, then you should support the football player that wants to, you know, kneel during the national anthem. Each case is different. Yes, we could construct arguments and so forth. And ditto on the left. You know, all these people on the left that think it's outrageous that, you know, professors that are talking about uh, white supremacy are being criticized by the right. Well, then you need to defend, you know, I think this is, I think all of us together need to work to create a culture of discourse, certainly within our universities and hopefully in the broader society. At least that's my view uh, of the kind of society I think we should have and that I'd like to live in. The difference in context matters. You don't, you don't have to give a platform to everybody. No, that's exactly right. You're not obliged. Let's be very clear. This is misunderstood as well. So on the disinvitation thing, nobody is automatically entitled to a platform at any institution. They, there are public squares for that in our society. You can get on a public square and sit on a soapbox and give a lecture. Um, so you're not entitled to, to speak at a university. Um, but I think once you're invited, you should, there should be a strong presumption against disinvitation unless there was in, information that was not known about you. So in the Chelsea Manning situation, everyone knew everything about Chelsea Manning. It's not like they were invited and suddenly discovered something about her. Um, you know, I don't think, I think universities should not yield to a mob crying for a disinvitation. I think that's bad precedent. Right. It would have been fine not to invite her. Yeah. Like if the committee said, we don't want her here for, she was a traitor. She, this is our belief, whatever, you know, that's their opinion. That's fine. And similarly, I also don't think we can, should, I think we should push back strongly against the heckler's veto or the silencing. So here's the other thing, which I know, you know, and many, but it's often misunderstood, which is when you heckle a speaker, when you prevent Charles Murray from speaking, and he's not a white supremacist. I mean, this slander of him is just appalling to me. Yes. Um, when you heckle a speaker or use bullhorns or hold or, or create a situation in which he cannot speak, you're not just injuring his or her rights, you're injuring the rights of all the people who wish to listen to that speaker. This is why assassinations are considered a worse crime than murder. It's because you're not only killing the person, but because you're depriving the electorate of their lawful will. And so I just don't, I, I think we've lost sight of that. I think we, you know, once you invite a speaker, they should speak and that you don't have to go or you can protest them. And I need to say something else, then I'll shut up. I strongly support the right of students to protest 
strongly. And I think most of the time the students are right. Not always, most of the time. You know, I'm uplifted by, by student movements and passion, but I do not think the students are, um, you know, uh, have the right to prevent other students from hearing whoever that is that they've invited to speak on our yeah. campus. So what form do you think that protest should take? Oh, I mean, I think there's lots of civil uh, a, a protests. I mean, I think there's lots of peaceful protests. I mean, this is the other thing that's extraordinary about one of the most extraordinary rights we have is the right of the people to peaceably assemble and petition the government for redress of their grievances shall not be infringed. I mean, that's a basic idea that's really But take me to a Charles Murray or Ben Shapiro event at Berkeley. Oh, they should hold posters outside. They can hold post they can they can assemble outside and object. They can uh they can um scream outside. They can come into the venue and and stand at the rear, you know, in most universities at Harvard and at Yale, they're very well defined and reasonable rules. You can lift posters in the back, but not in the front. Why? Well, in the front, you obstruct other people's views. Right. In the back, you don't obstruct people's views. I mean, that's like not a hard distinction to make. But you, sh you should have to be quiet and let the event proceed. Right? Yes, you can't have a heckler's veto. That's right. So you can, and they're, and they're also, but within their tolerance too. Like, so if you, you know, uh, you know, for a brief interruption is tolerated. I mean, we're trying to educate students. We don't want a punitive, you know, police, police state, you know, if a, you know, for example, even at most of these institutions, there are even rules of thumb for the university police. If someone seizes the podium for 30 seconds and then leaves, then we don't do anything. If they do it for more than 30 seconds, then we send the cops up to get rid of them, you know, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So there are, so I'm not endorsing that. I don't think that's a good course of action. But my point is, there are procedures in place to tolerate reasonable protest and opposition. And, and, uh, and, and when you cross the line is when you prevent the ability of others to hear the, their chosen speaker uh, on a campus. Yeah. Uh, again, these, these lines are very hard to draw because it, it does depend on the speaker. I mean, so if you, have, if you have a speaker who gets death threats, you know, plausible death threats, you have someone like Ayan Hirsi Ali on a college campus. Yeah, but Ayan, but these death threats, again, are not free expression. No, right? no, but I'm just saying, if somebody, if a student jumps up on stage there to seize the mic for 30 seconds... Yes. I'm not, which I'm not defending, but I'm just saying there are rules of thumb about what we do. Yeah, but no, but in that context, the rule of thumb just can't be applied. Anyone who jumps on the stage w when Ion is speaking, that has to be perceived as a security problem. Yeah, I mean, I, I won't speak for Ion because what she's had to endure is just absurd. But what I will say is, is that in a university community, we can tell students that, you know, we, we prohibit you jumping on the stage and seizing the microphone or intimidating speakers because we'll blah, blah, blah. But I would not, as, a, as an educator, I would not be in favor of a rule that said, if a student does that, they're suspended for a year. I, I think that's too draconian. And, and typically, we have rules of thumb about how we uh, cope with that. Um, you know, for example, the, the no placards rule, you know, you can't obstruct the, the vision of the, of the person, uh, you know, but if a student, you know, unfurled a protest banner off to the side in the front of the room, you know, we would not immediately have the police tackle them. Right. Uh, you know, we would sort of say, you need to move on. I, I just, you know, it's like we want the police to exercise judgment um, and restraint. Um, and we, we, we want to sustain the fundamental commitment that the speaker is to be allowed to speak in a civilized way. But we also recognize competing demands for protest. And, and you know, sometimes it pushes a little bit the boundaries. Now, again, you and I are discussing what I would call really tiny boundary conditions. I mean, nobody, I would not endorse what happened at Middlebury. I mean, I think that was preposterous. In the most egregious instance, it was totally illegal. It was an assault. I mean, these, Yes. Well, that's another thing. Yes. Been... Well, of course, assault is yet again another hole. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Um, yes. This may be a question you don't want to answer, but in your case at Yale, how did the other professors and the administration respond? I mean, what was the aftermath? Is it, has that resolved itself adequately, or is it... Well, I think administrations around the country, you know, are facing a lot of challenges in coping with these events. And I think, I think uh, you know, as time has gone by, um, there, there's more uh, sort of received wisdom about sort of what's happening and how to navigate this terrain. So I think, I think it's these, these events are hard in the moment to cope with. And this is why I think principles are so important as well. You know, why do we have principles? Um, you know, why do we commit ourselves to... Um, sort of restraint in punishment. You know, why, why I object to, for instance, uh, 
sentencing guidelines that give reduce the latitude of of uh, of uh, judges. The reason we promulgate principles to live by, whatever those principles are, are so that in the heat of the moment, we have a go-to set of ideas that can help us address challenges that we otherwise might find difficult. And this is why we have this commitment to free expression in our society, because it's hard. Free speech is hard. Um, and, and so we have to commit to it when, when we are in the cool light of day, because when, the, when it comes up in an impassioned moment, it's very, very tempting to fold. Yeah. And yeah. that's not the right course, in my view. So well, let's just talk about the phenomenon of moral panic. We'll remain somewhat agnostic as to how big a problem this is on college campuses nationwide. But where it is a problem, it does strike me that it has the character of what I'm calling a moral panic. And, and there have been other moral panics in our history you know, relatively recent. You and I are both old enough to remember the childhood sexual abuse panic in preschools. Yeah, the, the daycare centers. Like ridiculous. the McMartin the preschool. And now it's not to say that no child ever gets abused in a preschool. But I'm pretty sure none of those cases where those people were sent to life in prison were guilty. Yeah, so I was amazed. It was like a witch trial. Yeah, I was amazed because I, I, I forget what year that happened, but, you know, it's, it's, it was in the, it was 80s. In the 80s. So, you know, I, I was probably in college myself and my memory of the McMartin preschool and, and I would ask our listeners who are old enough to know something about it to just take this test right now in real time my memory was that you know though there was some aspects of the case that were not as they first seemed basically something horrible did happen there and no and I don't think no no I mean it was I since looked it up and it seems that what you have is a story of, as you said, something like a witch trial where you had perfectly innocent people accused of impossible crimes and, in this yes. case, sent to prison. Yes. Yes, it was a, 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 a unbelievable. There were many, many such cases, and it was a kind of moral panic in our society. And, and you know, it's, it's, uh, it's one of those things where it's like a kind of a Stasi or like a witch trial. It's like a circular denunciation. You you have to denounce others lest you fall under suspicion. And so these, it's, you know, why these, you know, what politician is going to come out and say, you know, we should, these, these prison sentences are inhumane. It's very difficult for the politician to do that because, you know, their opponent will accuse them of being soft on crime. Yeah, or in this case, soft on child sexual yeah, abuse. Well, yeah, exactly. You're, wait a minute, you're defending child molesters? Of course I'm not defending child molesters. What are you talking about? Uh, you know, but, but, you know, that, but that's the problem uh, in those types of situations where you have a kind of... Um, preference falsification, you know, where people are afraid to reveal their true beliefs because they think, you know, it's the, the emperor has no clothes phenomenon and everyone, you know, agrees that the emperor is wearing beautiful clothes. And in fact, he's not. Uh, and everyone sort of agrees that these has, you know, agrees that the horrible sexual abuse is taking place in these preschools because they're afraid they'll be accused of being unsympathetic. But of course, it's not what's happening. So but these are situations where just the the numbers that are being claimed can give the lie to the phenomenon. I remember that the journalist and, and writer Lawrence Wright was on my podcast, and he, he wrote a book that was somewhat related to this phenomenon of, of the satanic ritual abuse, moral panic. And he remembered when this was just becoming prominent in the news, he, he as a journalist, got interested in it, and he went to a, a seminar I believe it was being taught by law enforcement in Texas on this issue of satanic cult abuse. And the claim was, I believe, given by a police officer in this context, that there were 50,000 child murders every year due to satanic cults in the United States. Now, and Lawrence remembers that, you know, at that moment he realized he was in the presence of a social phenomenon that he had never witnessed because there has never been a year in the United States where there was anything like 50,000 murders, murders. Of, of any kind, right? Yes. So, and here you have law enforcement talking about 50,000 babies essentially being, you know, sacrificed to Satan. And there are examples of this. And again, I, you know, I don't know if we have the the reliable data on all these questions, but the, you know, there, it's claimed, for instance, that something like one in three or one in five girls who goes to college get raped 
at college. Apologies for the, the people who will get pissed off here because I, I haven't actually done my homework on this topic, but I got to think that, and I know that there are people like Christina Hoff Summers and others who have come out and said the, these statistics are totally wrong, and here's why. I just haven't followed the plot here. But I got to think there's, if one in three or one in five women who go to college is getting raped, I, I would be astonished if we are actually in that situation. If college were that dangerous for women, either what is being considered a rape is being defined down so preposterously as to get to that number, or the number is a fiction. It's just, it seems like we, we should be faster than we are to diffuse some of this just by getting a hold of the relevant facts. Well, I wouldn't disagree with you on the importance of facts. I mean, that's, I mean, you know, one of the, you know, I think with my, when I have political arguments with my friends, and I have friends from the reasonably far left to the reasonably far right, I, um, you know, I think it's one thing we can agree on a set of facts, and then we can have a, a disagreement about our ideology. You know, uh, this is what the income inequality is in our society today. This is knowable piece of information. This is what social science tells us about what some of the causes of inequality are. We can now discuss what, if anything, we wish to do about this situation. And 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 the right and the left will have different ideas about about it. But it's like climate change. You know, I mean, what I hate about this is like, you know, we may or may not decide that it's worth us responding to climate change. I mean, I think we should. That's my opinion. I have a sort of a left-wing opinion about this. But I really don't like the idea of trying to put your head in the sand and say, um, you know, because I don't want to engage a difficult policy decision. Instead, I'm going to deny the factual basis of it. Um, and I and I think we've lost a lot of that. Now, I, I'm not enough of a historian to know. I suppose my political science friends or my historian friends would say that probably American political discourse has always had this strand in it. But in my lifetime, it seems that we've gotten less technocratic about our the way we approach uh, sort of policy problems and much more ideological. And I, I have seen evidence to support that, that you know the ideological dis separation uh, in, the, in the Congress, for instance, is at an all-time high. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is, is that, I, you know, like that famous saying, you're entitled to your own opinion, but not to your own facts. I just wish we could get to a point where we could agree on whatever the, you know, we, we were facing a problem of whatever the type is. Let's agree on the facts, and then we can decide, you know, what to do about it. And, and, and fear of where we might get shouldn't lead me to denying the, the necessity or the accuracy of what necessity of acquiring or the accuracy of the, whatever facts we, we, you know, we are looking at. Well, so let's connect this conversation to some of the scientific work you've done over the years and your study of social contagion and social networks and now the new work you're doing with AI and, you know, rather like a low-level AI and how, it, and even strangely enough, deliberately inaccurate AI or random yeah. AI on how that can enhance human behavior. What what does science know about human beings individually and most importantly collectively and their behavior that can help us move toward something more rational and ideal here? Yeah, I mean we we do in my lab we we do a lot of work on uh, different aspects of these types of ideas. We we have a program of research on the um evolutionary biology and the behavior genetics of human friendship. So we, we try to understand why do people befriend each other at all? Um, you know, other animals don't do this. Other animals have sex with each other, uh, as we do, um, but we also befriend each other. We form long-term, non-reproductive unions with other members of our species. And uh, elephants do this, which is amazing. Um, certain other primates, um, certain whales uh, form friendships. But, um, but it's very rare in the animal kingdom. So we, we try to understand the origins of this this practice and uh, and its meaning uh, for us as a species, um, and we have a program of research which tries to understand um, phenomena of social contagion. Um, you know, how is it that um, ideas and norms, and also biological contagions, germs, can spread in human populations, and how might we exploit an understanding of these to intervene in social systems to make the world better? For example, can we create artificial tipping points in the developing world? Can we thoughtfully and shrewdly target structurally influential individuals. So in these villages, if we get these five people to change their mind about this public health practice, the whole village will copy them. 
we have support from the Gates Foundation and from other, uh, and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the National Institutes of Health. We do a lot of work that's trying to invent techniques to um, foster uh, behavior change at scale, population level scale. And this is, incidentally, the, some of this research is sort of dangerous because it has a sort of dual use. I, I was giving a talk about our work in a country that I won't name a few years ago. And, um, and, af and I was talking about how some of the work of one of my colleagues, James Fowler, had done on voting and increasing using ideas of social contagion to increase turnout. And uh, these people came and were asking me all these questions. And I realized at some point that this, that this was a sort of authoritarian country, that they, um, let's just say it was not a democracy, that they were asking me these questions to kind of reverse engineer what we were doing. They were not interested in increasing voter turnout yeah. or facilitating the spread of true information. They wanted to suppress the spread of true information and reduce turnout, let's say. So, um, so they're dual use. So there are interesting ethical questions here about some of the stuff that many labs, including ours around the country, are engaged in in sort of social engineering. And then the third thing we do is we, uh, which you're alluding to, and then I'll give you an example of why I think that work is interesting, and it's a little bit related to everything else we've been discussing today, is we do work where we uh, use some software that we've put in the public domain that allows us to create temporary artificial societies of real people. We recruit thousands of people online and we put them in for an hour or two hours for them to play in our online laboratory, a kind of a social games. And we're able to model social challenges, like social traps that groups fall into. And many of the things we've been discussing, whether it's racism or, or mob action or violence, are, are a kind of social trap. They're a way in which individuals, when they act together, do things that are against their own interests and against the group interest. So we, we've created a set of ways of exploring things like how do people share better and how do we get people to coordinate their activity better and how do we get people to cooperate better or how do we get people to evacuate efficiently in a, in, a, in a disaster situation. So we built all these models of real people acting in these situations. And what we're beginning to do is to add artificial intelligence agents to these social systems. So what, what we're doing is there's, we're creating hybrid systems, heterogeneous systems of humans and machines. So think about autonomous vehicles on the road where there are people that are driving their cars and their driverless cars. How do we program the driverless cars to behave in a fashion that gets the people to act so that not only are the driverless cars driving in a safe way, but they're kind of modeling and encouraging safe driving by all the other people as well. So what we've done in my lab is, is we've invented a, a bunch of techniques to do this. And so the way I summarize this idea is that we're not a laboratory that is trying to invent, you know, AlphaGo or, or, uh, or IBM Watson or some super smart, you know, neural net. Uh, and trained, you know, machine learning and trained algorithms that that try to reproduce human cognition. That is to say, we are not trying to invent smart AI that replaces human cognition. Instead, what we've been focused on is what we call dumb AI that supplements human interaction. So can we have very simple, dumb, trivial agents, which when mixed in to a population of humans, Help the humans to help themselves. Help us overcome some of these social dilemmas. Get us to be less racist and less trolly online. Get us to be able to share with each other better. Get us to be able to coordinate efforts better together. And the paper, the most recent paper we had, we were able to show that uh, we took 4,000 people and put them into groups of 20. And then sometimes we sneakily replaced the people with some bots. And then the people were given a collective challenge, like they all had to coordinate on a solution to a problem. And if they worked together, they were all paid. And if they didn't, they weren't paid. And we showed that by adding some bots, we were able to get the groups of people to work more effectively together. And specifically, as you alluded to, one of the sneaky or tricky things that we did is that we found that the bots, that the programming, the dumb AI programming we had to give the bots, was that the bots had to be a little bit imperfect, that adding a little noise to the system adding a few people who were deliberately making wrong choices unlocked the potential of the group to converge on the proper solution. And if you give me more time, I can give you a metaphor about why that is the case. Yeah. Why do you think that was the case? Well, let me give you, uh, let me give you an example. So, um, so imagine that I took, imagine we have a landscape uh, of hills and a mountain. So there are a bunch of hills of different heights and one big mountain. And then I take four people 
and I drop them at a random spot on this landscape, and I handcuff them together so they're each facing in north, south, east, east, west, and I blindfold them. So that's the scenario. We have a landscape with hills and a mountain, and I randomly pick a spot on this landscape, and I drop four people, and they're blindfolded and handcuffed together, and I say, okay, guys, climb to the highest mountain. And so the people talk amongst themselves, and they say, well, why don't we each take a step in our direction and report back which way is uphill? So they each take a step, and North says it's uphill from here. East and West say it's lateral from here, and South says it's downhill from here. So they all collectively move a step North. And then they repeat the experiment. Now West says it's uphill from here, so they take a step West. And they keep doing this, and eventually they get to the point where they all say it's downhill from here. Well, have they arrived at the highest mountain in this landscape? No. They've arrived at the nearest hill. Right. And they're on the top of the nearest hill, and now they're trapped there. They can't escape it. So how do they find the highest mountain? In order to find the highest mountain, we have to let them make some mistakes. We have to let them take some steps downhill occasionally, even though it makes no sense. And if we let them make some mistakes, if we tolerate some noise in the system, a little error, then let's say 10% of the time, we let them go downhill. Even We let them go downhill even though they shouldn't, right. let's say. Right. So now... There's some probability that they'll take a sequence of downhill steps, get down to the, another valley, and climb a different mountain. And eventually, they'll explore the whole landscape, and ultimately, they will come to the highest mountain. They'll find the global optimum, not just the local optimum, and they'll get trapped there because the global optimum is so high, that mountain is so high, that even if they take 10 or 20 or 100 steps down, they turn around and come back up because it's the highest mountain. And so that's why adding a little noise tolerating a little error in these groups helps them to find the global optimum and not just the local optimum. And we showed that this, we proved that this could work, and there are a bunch of other results in this paper. But the gist of it is not even the specifics that noise is helpful for search. For instance, you and I remember when we were in college, actually, there's some ways in which the, the online searching algorithms are degrading our ability to find useful information because they're so specific. When you and I wanted to find a biography of Winston Churchill or Che Guevara, we went to the library and, uh, and you know, there was the book we were looking for. And then near it, there were better books. So a little noise, a little error got us to find a superior outcome. We don't want too much error. We don't want to be on a different floor of the library and be encountering, you know, biochemistry textbooks when we're looking for historical figure biographies. But we want a little bit of error, and that leads to optimality. This is well understood. So, uh, so what we've been able to show is that there are many social dilemmas where we can add a little artificial intelligence into these hybrid systems and, um, and uh, help populations of humans. And in fact, we're beginning to think about ways to do this with a problem of fake news as well. You know, how can we improve the quality of discourse in our society, perhaps by using some of our ideas? And do you have ideas beyond adding noise in this case? I mean, well, actually, but before you go there, how generalizable is this principle to human decision-making? Well, the making? noise principle, I mean, we're not the first to think of that or explore that. I mean, we our work was looking at in social systems, and I, I gave the analogy of search a moment ago. There, these are well understood other examples. For instance, mutation in biology is an example. Um, if you think about a reproducing organism, if it reproduced with perfect fidelity at each generation, that actually might be problematic because you know, if the environment yeah. changed the organism would die. Right. So you need, a little, you need a little lack of fidelity in transmission, a little mutation in each generation is a good thing, actually. It permits the organism to explore a larger part of the evolutionary landscape. So, so the idea of noise, and it's also known as simulated annealing, I mean, there's, there's a number of ideas about the importance of error, light, slow amounts of error in um, similar, there's some similar principles in, in chemistry with catalysis. I mean, it's, just a, it's a generic scientific idea. But we, we explored it in these social systems. But the, the higher order claim here is that there should, it should be possible to create a family of simply programmed agents, not necessarily just with noise as it's simple programming. There are other kinds of ideas which could be introduced into social dilemmas, cooperation, coordination, navigation, evacuation, et cetera, sharing, and help people to overcome traps uh, because they're not able to work effectively together. Right. So we, we have a number of ideas. Uh, racism, online racism, there, we have some ideas about this as well. I cited a paper earlier in our conversation done by a different laboratory. So 
when you were talking, I was reminded of an experience I had, and this relates back to just the dynamics of crowds. It was one point now, I don't know, 25 years ago, where I, I briefly had to function as one of the bodyguards for the Dalai Lama when he was traveling in France. Oh, wow. And this was, you know, this is the Dalai Lama at the height of his fame and in France where he, he really is received as a, a kind of head of state. So he had proper bodyguards. He had like four guys with analogous to our Secret Service, guys with guns around him. But they wanted us, the, the people who were, you know, studying with him, Buddhist meditators, to be the kind of the buffer between them and the crowds. Yes. Just by the sheer fact of proximity, we were the ones who had all of the conflict with the, the people yes. in the crowds, press and, and, and otherwise. And, and one thing I noticed very early on, I mean, we, we were, it was just crowd after crowd after crowd, the difference between a crowd where there was some demarcation, you know, like a, a physical barrier, but it could have been as, as tenuous as something like a, just a velvet rope, where there was some demarcation as to where to stand if you're part of the crowd. And when there wasn't a demarcation, that was the difference between absolutely peaceful, civil order and just utter chaos. That is the simplest possible bot, right? We're just talking about a rope. And so are there, are there general principles that you have found beyond adding a little noise in conditions analogous to search? Yeah, there, there are some ideas, but, uh, you know, we haven't published them all yet. and. Um... And I'm not sure I want to talk about them just yet till we sort of nail down more of the details. I have a book that's forthcoming in about a year or so uh, from Little Brown. The title of the book is Blueprint, um, and it's on the sort of the evolutionary foundation of a good society. Oh, nice. And I'll be discussing some of these ideas in that book um, and sort of, uh, you know, how is it that um, that natural selection has shaped not just the structure and function of our bodies, not just the structure and function of our minds, but also the structure and function of our societies. And, and some of the principles we've been discussing, you know, are very relevant to that, you know, on the specific example of, of the bots, there is a way in which you, we are actually experimenting with a separation bot right now, uh, which I don't want to go into too much. But, um, but it, it kind of is like the Dalai Lama example you gave, it, it kind of enforces a kind of um, uh, perimeter of uh, fewer social connections uh, between groups, and it manipulates the structure of the network, this bot does, in, in ways that uh, we believe will um, improve uh, human welfare. It's, it's interesting, because when, when you get into this space, you discover things that are right on the surface of human experience and have been there your whole life, but you, you may have never noticed them. And, and one thing that I've noticed of late is that that civility and even just good manners are a barrier, a very clear barrier against violence. When things are, are genteel and civil and predictable and people, you know, hold the door for one another. But only if it's real, Sam. You see, this is the problem. If it's like, if it's like, um, if, you know, if you have, uh, you know, this is an extreme example. I know that's not what you're saying, but, you know, you could have very the use of the word genteel, of course, conjures up, you know, genteel plantations where, right. meanwhile, there's slavery. And um, there can be situations where you're exporting your horror to some other conditions. Ex yes. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, I think, you know, I think like the Romans, you know, had a very, you know, or the Greeks, to, you know, had a, you know, had a tr very civilized uh, culture of parliamentary debate, you know, but only for a fraction of the population. So, so yes, I think you're absolutely right. I think there are norms, as you said, of, of, um, of, uh, of politeness, which, uh, you know, and discourse, as, which is what the theme for today, uh, discourse and groups, I would say, is the theme for today, uh, which, you know, which um, serve the function of reducing violence. I mean, this is Greg Lukianoff's point. We use our words so as not to kill each other. Yeah, yeah. This is progress, yeah. right? This is the whole point. We, we talk to each other. We even say vile things to each other. And we have a, a, a culture that allows that so that we don't draw swords. And, um, and this, in fact, is one of the gifts of the Enlightenment, I believe. I believe that's the origin of the handshake. Yeah, yes, yes. I think that I've heard that same story that, you know, I, there's no gun and there's no weapon in my hand. Um, although chimpanzees will touch each other's hands, Jane Goodall has shown in a very similar 
kind of handshakey kind of way. Um, but but your point is that um, you know this this I think there is a sense in which certain norms do prevent violence, and uh, and there is some old wisdom there that uh, is, you know is is uh, is valuable. Well, listen, Nicholas, it's been really a a, a feast to uh, see the world through your eyes for nearly an hour and a half here. Um, and I will have to have you back when you publish your blueprint so you can divulge ah, all of your secrets. I would welcome the chance to come back. Thank you so much, Sam, for having me. Yeah, really been, been great. Where would you like people to find out more about your work in the meantime before your new book comes out? Well, I mean, I can be followed on Twitter. And uh, my Twitter, I think my handle is N.A. Christakis. And, um, and I have my lab website is humannaturelab.net, humannaturelab.net. And all our research is there. And videos of the work we're doing around the world and our software is downloadable there. There's lots of resources. Great, great. Well, write that book. <laughs> I have to finish it now, yes. Fix complex social systems for us and fix Twitter while you're at it because <laughs> there's a lot of fixing that needs to be done. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. If you're enjoying the Waking Up podcast,